Now that we have a solid background on farming in southwestern Ontario, we're going to go visit Roger and Romina, the owners of our field. Super handy for our fields and our organic farming is that those birds produce a lot of poo. <laughs> uh, so chicken manure is really great. Hi everyone, my name's Ranger M and I work at Catfish Creek Conservation Authority. I'm the community outreach technician and that means I do a lot of this, chatting about all things nature and conservation with kids, adults, teachers, everyone. I love to knowledge share and that's just what I'm gonna do with you. So come on, let's go learn with Ranger M. Hi everyone, this is Garrett. Hi everyone. And he's gonna join me today in talking about farming in southwestern Ontario. Garrett is our conservation lands technician and you may actually remember him from episode three where he helped me explore the aquatic world. But Garrett's actually joining us today because he is a farmer and he's gonna give us that perspective today. Obviously when it comes to our survival, just like wildlife, we need space, habitat, water, and most importantly, food. We have been quite the intelligent species when it comes to cultivating our crops and our food. We have been hunters and gatherers for centuries and we've really grown what we know. We now have food that can fit any diet from meatitarians to vegans or any allergy from celiac or dairy intolerance. Farming is one of the oldest careers in our lifetime and we can tell that agriculture and farming is vital to our survival. So in this episode, we're going to discuss food production, how and why it happens, and then also some environmental and sustainable farming practices that happen in southwestern Ontario. Firstly, we have to discuss some of the history of farming in southwestern Ontario. As previously mentioned in other episodes, southwestern Ontario is surrounded by four lakes and has a geography that's very unique and creates a beautiful farm belt in Ontario. There are approximately 100,000 jobs within the farming sector of southwestern Ontario alone. This represents 14% of the paid workforce in this region. Little southwestern Ontario is doing an amazing job to boost our local economy as well as our provincial and federal economies. Now we do live in the northern hemisphere and that means we can't grow all of the world's fruits and vegetables here. Especially we can't grow year round because we have a lot of snow and frost. So that means Ontario does run some food deficits, meaning we have to import some fruits and vegetables like cabbage and potatoes. Therefore, we need to work to increase these sectors, especially considering our growing population and the need to improve our economy. A study estimated that more than half of Ontario's $20 billion of yearly imports can be grown within Ontario, with the Southwest having the best potential. On the bright side, Ontario does produce some surpluses in foods like tomatoes and sweet corn. With increasing pressures on biodiversity, our ecosystems, and our crop fields, the demand for sustainable farming has never been greater. One method we combat this issue is through agroecology. Agroecology is the application of ecological concepts and principles to agriculture. As a system, it optimizes interactions between plants, animals, humans, and the environment while safeguarding the social aspects of a sustainable and fair food system. A system like agroecology can deliver food security and ecosystem health while still promoting economic stability. Agroecology is location and situation specific. It's not a one size fits all situation to sustainable farming. And we definitely have to remember that while living in Northern Hemisphere because we like our bananas and raspberries year round. Do you know which fruit is produced the most in Southwestern Ontario? Apples? peaches, strawberries, or grapes. Do you know which fruit is produced the most in southwestern Ontario? Apples, peaches, strawberries, or grapes? Grapes account for just over 17,000 acres of the almost 38,000 acres of fruit crops in southwestern Ontario. Agroecology, or sustainable farming, can be quite simple to implement through what is known as best management practices. These are practical, affordable approaches to conserving soil, water, and other natural resources in rural areas. It can also be applied technology to enhance farm production without sacrificing soil and water resources. These can include practices like no-till, windbreakers, cover crops, integrated pest management, and others. So I'm going to turn it over to Garrett, who's going to explain no-till. Thank you, Emily. 
So first of all, what is till or tillage? Tillage is the practice of preparing land for the purpose of growing crops through mechanical manipulation of soil, which can also include the applications of fertilizer and herbicides. With tillage, depending on the landscape, soil erosion can be a major issue, which is where soil particles progressively move downhill from upper slope areas and accumulate at lower slope areas. Research has shown that this type of erosion can decrease crop yields up to 40%. This is where farmers can sometimes implement best management practices such as no-till where the current crop is planted into the previous year's crop residue or contour tillage where you till across the slope instead of with the slope. Or you can also do mulch tillage where you leave some crop residue on the top of the soil. You can also reduce uh, tillage speed or tillage intensity. That's enough about tillage for now, so back over to you, Ranger M. Thanks, Garrett. Did you know wind can actually cause a lot of damage to our crop fields? Excessive wind with minimal tree cover on the field can actually move our soil off the fields and into the roads and ditches. With that movement, they take all of the organic matter, the soil nutrients and inputs, which actually really degrades the health of our soil. And this makes our soils more susceptible to pest infestations as well. With climate change comes the increase in weather frequency and diversity. So we can only predict that this issue will become worse in the future. Windbreaks are vegetative barriers that help reduce or eliminate the negative impacts of excessive wind. It's basically one or two rows of trees or shrubs that help protect your soils from erosive effects of water and wind. Windbreaks also help with moisture distribution, they act as a carbon sink, and they provide habitat and food for wildlife. They also offer up a potential secondary income. They could be used as Christmas trees or even firewood. Now Garrett's going to tell us more about cover crops. Thank you, Emily. So now cover crops. Cover crops are exactly what the name says they are. They cover the soil in our crop fields. These are crops that are planted for the purpose of preserving soil instead of being harvested. They may be an off-season crop grown after harvesting cash crops, or they may also be grown over the winter. One of the main reasons for growing cover crops is to have growth on the top surface soil while also having the roots stabilize the subsurface soils. Cover crops also help with adding organic matter and nutrients to the soil, reducing compaction and improving soil structure, reducing pest populations, and even assist in water management. Examples of cover crops include cereals such as rye, oats, and barley, legumes like alfalfa and clover, radishes, and even flowers like marigolds. And now Ranger M will tell you about integrated pest management. Thanks Garrett. Integrated pest management is actually utilizing insects and other pests to manage or control our harmful pest populations within our crop fields. Integrated pest management also helps decrease the use of pesticides in our crop fields. This involves a lot of monitoring and preparation as well as proper abundance use of our pest populations to make sure that we're maximizing the effects to our target species, but minimizing the adverse effects to our beneficial species. Integrated pest management programs allow economic control over our pest species, but also allow for our natural and beneficial species to survive. Did you know of the 3.4 million acres of land in crops over 1.3 million of those are dedicated to soybeans alone. Did you know of the 3.4 million acres of land in crops, over 1.3 million of those are dedicated to soybeans alone? As production and processing grow, Canada is becoming a more important soybean supplier and soybeans are becoming a more important force in the Canadian economy. Common end uses for Ontario soybeans include specialty food grade markets for things such as edamame, tofu, soy sauce, and miso, and also is used in oil production for food and industrial processes and livestock feed. Now that we have a solid background on farming in southwestern Ontario, we're going to go visit Roger and Romina, the owners of our fields. Roger and Romina are going to tell us about their farm and maybe a little history and background on it. My dad started the farm. Uh, he was always a farm worker, laborer, and then he got uh, this farm to manage uh, as a dairy operation 20 some odd years ago. Uh, he then bought the farm and uh, since has switched to a poultry operation and we have kind of separated off a couple acres here to do some ecologically grown vegetables 
and the rest of the farm is conventional. That's awesome. That's really cool how you can have both on one property and but still work kind of in a family farm environment. Yeah. It works together. It's about balancing everyone's ideas while trying to transition to something new. It took some convincing because Roger and I's background is in biological sciences. Like we have master's degrees that are in genetics, genetics and fish fisheries and some what seems to not be applicable at all to what we're doing now. <laughs> However, like we you know, like as biologists that we care about the ecology and the dynamics of the ecosystems on a farm like this. And, but we don't have the pressure of having to make it work financially on such a small acreage right now. We also have off farm jobs. So this is kind of a transitional period where we're trying to establish something that we can believe in and that we feel like is good for the environment, but also makes money. We're gonna go check out some parts of the farm. So come along. So what type of agriculture do you all participate in on your field? So we have our small scale vegetables, which is in the area around us now. And then we have cash cropping. Uh, so we do corn, soybeans, wheat on rotation. And then we also have a uh, poultry operation. We are broiler growers. Half of that though is done by your dad and his farm. That's right. And then the small uh, vegetable farming is mostly you guys. That's right. Can you tell us anything about just because I know we can't go into the poultry far, uh, barn, but can you tell us anything about chicken farming? Um, I know it's obviously very important to Ontario as a whole, both for a meat production and egg production. More and more people are choosing chicken, and I'm I don't know if they've discussed really like what's driving that, but. Canada and Ontario especially, the chicken, the rate of like eating, people purchasing and eating chicken keeps going up. Um, and there's a shift away, it seems, from red meats. I don't know what's driving that, if it's people conscientious about climate change and the impacts of their choices, uh, but there's health considerations, health considerations yep, with red meat and saturated fats. But there's more and more demand for chicken and white meats. We are raised without antibiotics, so we are an antibiotic-free bird. Uh, so we just do kind of a lot of um, preventative measures to make sure our birds are healthy. They're also all grain fed. Uh, so the corn, some of the corn that we grow on the property is then milled off-site and turned into the pelletized feeds that the birds will get. <laughs> and then within the barn, they are free run. They're not a, a caged bird or anything like okay. that. They get as much food and water as they want and they can travel wherever they want in the space of the barn. But yeah, that's, that's how they're raised in there. And in a barn that size, that one has two floors and it's 13,000 birds per floor. Cool. And uh, also super handy for our fields and our organic farming is that those birds produce a lot of poo. <laughs> uh, so chicken manure is really great. It's high in nitrogen and has a lot of other minerals that we need and other nutrients we need for the vegetables to grow. So the only thing we really amend the soil with at all for our organic veg production is chicken manure. Once again, what a circular economy <laughs> farm you have. Yeah. Okay, so you guys touched on how you're a broiler bird operation. Um, we just want to go through the difference of what a broiler bird is and what other kind of chickens operations there is. Uh, so a broiler is a meat bird. Uh, we're raising them to 2.15 kilos. That's where our shipping weight is. Um, the flock that we have in is typically pullets, which are female birds. Uh, you can also get mixed flocks. Uh, or you could be a layer operation and be doing uh, chickens, or you could have a flock that's being used for hatchery eggs. So on your farm, do you guys do anything with like a nutrient management plans? Or what yeah, kind absolutely. Of it's it, it's uh, mandatory if you have a chicken barn, you have to have a nutrient management plan to make sure uh, all the manure that you're producing can be uh, distributed around the farm on your acreage in an environmentally conscious way. It's going to be stored properly so it's not uh, going to contaminate groundwater or contribute to surface water runoff and that kind of stuff. So yeah, we definitely have to have a plan in place. 
So being a conservation authority in a very rural area, we have a lot of interactions with our local farmers because they're one of our largest landowners. And um, doing that, we talked to them a lot about best management practices. And I was just wondering, because I know you have some implemented on your farm, if you could go into some details about them. Yep, so right behind you, Emily, is an example of us using cover crops. So we try not to have any bare soil if we can help it. If there's time to grow something on bare soil, then we use a cover crop to keep that topsoil where it needs to be and also like add nutrients to the soil so it's ready for planting when we do need to plant. This field behind, behind you, Emily, is a cover crop we planted in August after we harvested the garlic. So this was the garlic field and the garlic grew from November to mid-July, mid-late July. And then as soon as we had that off, we were gonna have bare soil. So we put in, we seeded this cover crop and all the different plants here add at least organic matter, if not other aspects to the soil. So there's peas in there that are nitrogen fixing. There's a tillage radish or a daikon radish that is really good at penetrating the layers of soil and uh, aerating it and you know, forcing water, when it rots, it'll force nutrients and water down into the soil layers and all kinds of other stuff in there, oats, sunflowers. And then um, we had a, we always have like a fallow field because we have a rotational situation going on here so that because we're, we grow organic vegetables, we can't use conventional sprays, broad spectrum sprays for a lot of the pests that might like to eat vegetables as well. So uh, we try to avoid those pests by planting the vegetables in new fresh soil by rotating all our crops. So uh, in that fallow field where there were no crops growing this year, we planted clover because it's a good nitrogen fixer and it will augment the soil there for when we plant garlic this year. So what do you mean when you say nitrogen fixer? There's an association between bacteria uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria and little nodules on the roots of leguminous plants like peas and beans and things like that. So those bacteria in association with the plant will take nitrogen gas out of the air and turn it into nitrogen that the plant can use and is maintained in the soil for other plants to take up. So it's a really good thing if you can have those nitrogen fixing plants have those relationships around uh, to add back into the soil because nitrogen is a big component of what plants pull out when they grow. We leave as much of the, what do you call it? You call it trash, but the- The residue? The residue, yeah. crop residue. <laughs> we leave them in the field. It gets rotted down and plowed down to keep as much of that organic matter in the soil as we can. Um, we do till, we're not a no-till operation, but we're moving towards uh, minimizing the tilling we did. It used to be all mullboard plowed, so the whole top layer of the soil was turned over, but that's pretty aggressive, so we're moving uh, more into like a, a rip tilling, that kind of a thing, where it's just a disc and some, some uh, cultivation strips, so it's less disturbance. Uh, we have a couple areas of the farm where we know we get surface water runoff, so we don't cultivate those in the fall. Uh, we make sure we either leave like a grassy waterway uh, all year round, or at the very least make sure we're not tilling in the fall and we're leaving all the crop residue there to slow that surface water so we're not getting erosion. Um, we have a cedar hedge that allows a bit of a windbreak uh, from the westerlies. And there we have um, reserved that bush behind you, Emily, is part of, half of that is part of this farm. So they've left that, you've left that for some break and for some shelter for animals and other organisms. So it's not uh, tilled all the way to the extremes of the farm. There's kind of a break on all the edges. And then for our, the our fields organic garden, we always plant a strip of wildflowers. Um, we had a strip of wildflowers that have now died, but hopefully they all come back again in the spring and they reseed themselves. So it was all along the ditch in the road. And then we had a wildflower strip uh, along the top as well. And uh, we find like flocks of goldfinches and the sunflowers and we're hoping beneficial insects find safe harbor there, even though there's other parts of the garden that are constantly being harvested and tilled, mm -hmm. that there are some refuges for some beneficial insects, hopefully. It also gives us a bit of a buffer for insects moving from other crops, uh, so they might find something interesting in the buffer strip as opposed to moving directly into our food, our food crop. <laughs> so yeah, yeah it doesn't always work, but it helps.
You include that into your pest management then. Absolutely, yeah. We are uh, we're starting with some clean seed garlic this year uh, from the research center up north. Uh, so that we, it's certified virus-free, nematode-free, fungus-free, uh, and we have to try to keep it that way. So um, being out in the open and protecting it from like sap-sucking insects coming over from the alfalfa fields in the neighboring farms, we're planning on uh, planting some buffer crops around that. So the aphids will come in, maybe sample those other buffer crops and deposit their viruses there rather than going directly into the garlic and affecting our clean seed. So. Wow, that sounds really cool. Yeah, those uh, that clean seed is grown like completely in a laboratory, so it's never touched the soil yet. So that's how they can guarantee that it's virus free. So that sounds so great. And just before we go, I would really like to check out your bees. All right. Do you know the only native fruit that grew in southwestern Ontario? Do you know the only native fruit that grew in southwestern Ontario? Pawpaw is a unique and odd looking fruit which is native to the Carolinian life zone. This shrub tree actually thrives in wet soil and grows in well rooted thickets, helping with soil erosion. Pawpaws, like most fruit, contain an amazing array of vitamins and health benefits. But one in particular is a great source of iron, over 50% of your daily value. Lastly, pawpaws have their own insecticide found in their bark, twigs, and leaves keeping all the insects away from harming them. Roger, I feel like this is just like a pet project, but can you tell us your <laughs> benefit of having bees on your farm? Sure, uh, a lot of the vegetables we grow are uh, require pollination. Uh, so this just really increases the chance of getting like a maximal yield. Um, not to mention we get great honey out of it every <laughs> year. So yeah, a little, little pet project I started this year uh, with beekeeping. Awesome. and. I don't know anything about beehives, but like, how does this work? They just go <laughs> in it and... Sure, well, they <laughs> these are a Langstroth hive, so they have frames uh, with a wax foundation uh, hanging on the inside of each of these boxes. And so they will build the comb out from that foundation and then fill it with either eggs and larvae and brood or honey. Okay. Depending on, or pollen depending on what they're storing. Awesome. I just want to thank Roger and Romina for showing us their farm. And I don't know about Garrett, but I sure learned a lot and I really had a good time. So thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Now farming does take a lot of patience, hard work and dedication because after all, farmers feed cities. But that doesn't mean we can't try our hand at farming. There are a couple different vegetables that we can attempt to regrow in our very own kitchens. The first are leafy green vegetables like celery, lettuce and green onion. After you have used as much of the vegetable as you want, cut off a tiny piece of the root end and place it in water. For celery and lettuce, you will see new leafy shoots coming up through the middle of the plant. The green onion will also have new shoots coming up through the middle, but you will also see roots forming in the water. For all of these vegetables, it only takes a few days to see results. After some time, all of these can be planted in dirt as well. The next vegetables are our root vegetables like beets, turnips, carrots, and potatoes. Similar to the leafy greens, after you have used as much of the vegetable as you want, put the root end into a couple inches of dirt and do this during the winter so after several months, you can plant these well-rooted vegetables into the garden. As always, have fun and see you in nature.